Welcome to my channel. This is today's episode of Daily News Clips. But before I get into that, I do want to thank you for coming to my channel. I greatly appreciate your patronage. I appreciate every single one of you that comes and watches my videos and comments on them and, and requests songs for me to react to. I really, really do appreciate it. I'm thankful to every one of you. The first item that I have today is something that I got really excited about. Uh, it's an over an hour long, so I'm not going to play it all for you. But um, I've already watched it three times, and I've read some of the, the verses that he refers to. And I'm excited about sharing this with you because, well, frankly, um, one of the conundrums that Christians have is explaining the creation story in Genesis. How did God create the earth and man in seven days? And scientists have basically ridiculed it, saying it's silly, it's a ridiculous story. Well, along comes this guy named Hugh Ross, who has dedicated his life to cosmology, which is the study of how the earth came into being. And he just lays it all out, and it's, it's unbelievable. It's amazing. Basically, the seven days of creation span a long period of time, not as long as the scientists like to say, but certainly longer than seven of our days. And he explains from the Bible exactly how each day happened. And it was just astonishing to me. I, I'd never heard this before. Uh, I'd never heard about this guy before. And I was absolutely amazed. And if you're a an atheist and you're watching this, I would just ask you to please watch with an open mind. Not reject it out of hand, but just listen to what the man has to say. Because he's very knowledgeable and very intelligent. And when he's done describing it, let me know what you think in the comments. I would appreciate that. So I've queued it up, and I'm going to play the part that I want you to hear. It's maybe about 10 minutes. Yes, and uh, so I, I started looking in the great philosophers, Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure mm. Reason. Mm -hmm. I looked at René Descartes, discovered that they didn't have the correct concepts of the universe mm -hmm. or space and time. And I went to a high school that was filled with refugees from all over the world. And so they were saying, hey, you need to read these books, Hindu Vedas, the Quran, Buddhist commentaries. So I began to go through them, and when I read the Vedas, I says, oh, this is where the oscillating universe model comes from. Mm. You know, Hinduism is based on reincarnation, that the universe reincarnates. But I knew that their time scale was incorrect. They said you get a new birth every 4.32 billion years, and that number clearly was wrong. I also realized the universe had way too high of an entropy measure to allow for any kind of restart. And uh, the Buddha said essentially the same thing. Uh, when I looked at the Quran, it says there's three accounts of creation, but they contradict one another. One of them claiming that the uh, planets are more distant than the stars. You don't need a telescope to realize that's incorrect. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I didn't meet Christians or get to know them until I showed up at Caltech to do postdoctoral research. But I did see two Christians from 30 feet away when I was 11 years old. These were two businessmen that came into our public school and made available Gideon Bibles. Hmm. This is the Gideon Bible that I started reading oh at age gosh. 17. So the cover's gone because our dog chewed it off. So. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but I started reading that Gideon Bible at age 17. And that was also the same time that physicists in South Africa and Britain were developing the first of the space-time theorems which basically prove that space and time have a beginning. Space and time are created. And what I notice about the Bible is that it stood alone in making the claim that space and time are created entities. 
what I saw in the Eastern religions, space and time are eternal, and God or gods create within space and time that always exists. So seeing that, that the Bible said something different that was being affirmed by the space-time theorems, said maybe this book really is from the one who created the so universe. So can you take me through Genesis and the creation and oh, sure. show me the science? Well, um, I was taught the scientific method in grade one, grade two, grade three. We got it all 12 years. And so when I picked up this uh, book, uh, the Bible, I looked at the first page, Genesis 1. I said, this perfectly follows the scientific method. It took me nine years to discover why it so perfectly followed the scientific method. Right. That's where it comes from. It comes from the creation texts in the Bible and uh, Reformation theology. Uh, but I looked at, uh, you know, uh, Genesis 1-2. The Spirit of God is hovering over the surface of the waters of planet Earth. And it gives you four initial conditions. It's dark everywhere on the surface. The water is everywhere. And the planet, Earth, is unfit for life and empty of life. Well, steps one and two of the scientific method are do not interpret until you establish the frame of reference. The point of view is the surface of Earth's waters. And don't interpret to also establish the starting conditions. Well, that's all laid out in Genesis 1 2. And I keep running into scientists who say Genesis teaches scientific nonsense. And I say, well, mm. Galileo said the biggest mistake you can make in Bible interpretation is to get the wrong point of view. And mm. when they say it's scientific nonsense, they think God is above the earth, looking down on the earth, and telling us what he did. Instead, it's God on the surface of the earth looking up at the clouds and telling us what he did. Makes a huge difference in how you interpret the six days of creation. Okay. And so, but, yeah, n nobody was helping on me on this. I just saw this in the text and said, okay. At 18. 17. 17. Yeah. <coughs> so, so I said, okay, uh, creation day one, let there be light. And I said, well, that's Excuse when the me. atmosphere goes from opaque to translucent. Uh, I knew enough about astronomy to realize Earth had to begin with an atmosphere 200 times thicker than it has today. An atmosphere that thick will not let any visible light through. The sun and stars existed, but there was no light on the surface of the waters of planet Earth. Day one is when the atmosphere was thinned out sufficiently that light could come through. And it says the Spirit of God was brooding over the surface of the waters that implies the origin of life. So I saw life being originated beginning at creation day one. And then you go into creation day two, water above and water below. I really didn't have an idea what that meant, uh, but when I got to the book of Job, it devotes one and a half chapters to creation day two and basically describes it as God's cycling water in the atmosphere above to the streams and lakes and oceans below and then back again. Oh my gosh. And actually describes six distinct forms of precipitation in Job 37 and 38. <clears throat> it mentions, for example, that there will be uh, dew and mist and rain and then snow and frost and hail. And again, I had enough science under my belt to realize that's the only way you can have billions of people living on the surface of the earth because the Earth's water cycle is designed to ensure no matter where you are, there's both frozen forms of precipitation and liquid forms so we can have rivers and streams that fill our years round and we have abundant food that can be grown everywhere. You need all six to make that possible. Then you get into creation day three and this is when land masses show up for the first time, when God transforms the Earth from a water world uh, to one with continents and oceans. And uh, at 19, I got to take a course on plate tectonics. As far as I know, it was the first course in the world that was taught on plate tectonics wow. at a university. That's because two of the three physicists who launched the discipline were at the University of British Columbia. Mm. Somehow I managed to get into that class as an undergraduate, and that's when they said, oh, the continents haven't always been here. It's plate tectonics that builds up the continents. And they thought it was a linear relationship from zero to where it is today. Today we know that it takes uh, deep oxygen cycle events to really accelerate the growth of the continental land masses. And so 
in 2018, they basically showed, yeah, for about the first billion years, uh, you got nothing but water, and then plate tectonics kicks in. Uh, but at the first great oxygenation event two and a half billion years ago, about 90% of the continental landmass forms. Wow. And so basically it shows that the more we learn about the past history of the Earth, the tighter and tighter fit we get with what the Bible taught about these land masses thousands of years ago. And then it talks about uh, vegetation on the land masses. And uh, I've debated the executive director of the Skeptic Society four times in university campuses. He always jumped on Genesis, no matter what we were talking about. Uh, and because he saw that as the Achilles heel of the mm -hmm. Christian faith. So he would always say, well, the fossil record shows us we got animals before we got vegetation on the continents. And I said, well, obviously, animals have skeletons and shells. That's going to be easily preserved. That's not the case for vegetation. It's going to decay. Right. But what happened in 2009 and 2011, two papers were published in Nature saying we now have the isotope evidence and in 2011, the fossil evidence that vegetation was abundant on the continental land masses 600 million years before the first animals show up. So again, it shows, hey, as we learn more, uh, it basically gives you a tighter and tighter fit. What would they have eaten if there was no vegetation, if there was no... Well, I think Michael Shermer was saying, yeah, there would have been vegetation in the oceans, but the biblical text says okay. vegetation on the land oh, masses. Land. Okay. He said, we have no fossil evidence of that. Well, we didn't during my first debate, uh, but we do now. We do have that evidence. Mm. And then uh, creation day four is when uh, creatures on the surface of the earth for the first time can see the sun, moon, and stars. And we now know the second great oxygenation event turned Earth's atmosphere from a dense haze to transparent. It's oxygen that determines how transparent the atmosphere is. And so experiment was done where they took the atmosphere of the Earth, started with less than 1% oxygen and pushed it up. Well, the second great oxygenation event, the oxygen level suddenly goes from 2% to 8% for the first time in Earth's history. That's enough to make the atmosphere transparent. Unbelievable. That's exactly the same time that the first animals appear. Animals can't function if they don't know where the sun, moon, and stars are in the sky. Mm. They need a transparent sky. Uh, but what we see in the fossil record, the very moment oxygen hit that minimum level for animals, animals suddenly appear. You go from nothing but microbial light to animals as big as two meters across. And then in creation day five, you also have God creating the sea mammals and the birds. Only the second time it uses the word create. The word create in Hebrew, baraz, for something brand new at God's hand. And what was brand new was animals that are not just physical, but soulish, in that they have mind, will, and emotions, a capacity to form relationships with one another, their offspring, they sacrifice for the offspring. They also are endowed with a capacity to form relationships with a higher species, namely us human beings, and to serve and please us. Mm. Then you get into creation day six, it doesn't talk about the first land mammals. It talks about the three categories of land mammals that are essential for launching human civilization. And Job 38 and 39 goes into that in great detail. Uh, and it's the short-legged land mammals, the rodents that we need for the clothing that humans were critically dependent upon when they first appeared. Because we humans, unlike the Neanderthals, right. are not adapted for a cold climate. We're fine in a warm climate, but not a cold climate. Mm -hmm. The rodents enabled us to go into cold climate zones. Then two different kinds of long-legged land mammals, those that are easy to tame, the herbivores we use for agriculture, those that are difficult to tame, the carnivores that we use for household companions. And last of all, God creates human beings, and only the third time does it use the word create. Because what's brand new about us, we're not just physical and soulish, we're spiritual. As these birds and mammals were designed to relate to a higher species, we are designed to relate to a higher being, the one that... That's enough. I'm going to be honest with you. I had a, a lengthy list, not super lengthy, but 
a more than usual list of news items that I wanted to share with you. But after coming across this yesterday and watching it already now twice and partly the third time and reading some of the texts like in Job that he mentions, I decided to share this with you as the daily news clip. Um, it's an hour long, so you're going to have to set aside some time to watch it. You, you can't just sit down and go through it in a few minutes. But I highly recommend that you watch this, regardless of what your beliefs are, regardless of what you think about God. This is some of the most thought-provoking discussion that I've seen in a long time. And this guy is clearly a scientist. So... Uh, that would be my my wish for you would be that you would take the time to give this the necessary attention that it needs in order for you to understand what he's saying. Now, before I sign off, I got to show you my shirt. I promised I'd do that. Irony, the opposite of wrinkly. It's one of my favorite shirts. <laughs> I sure love doing this. I'm having so much fun, I swear. I really am enjoying this. I love getting to share with you and and show you new discoveries and new songs and new artists. It's just so much fun. And we're going to get into that in just a minute. But first, I got to pray for you. And so today, I'm going to pray a little bit differently. I pray that your eyes will be open to the truth and that you will see the truth for what it is. And that any scales that have been on you, that have kept you from seeing the truth, will be cast aside. I pray that when you see the truth, it will bring you peace and understanding. And that you will know God as I do. That's my prayer for you today. This is the Vietnam Mirror Vet out.